Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Bill George, who is the former CEO and chairman of Medtronic, professor at Harvard, now an executive fellow at Harvard. And most importantly, Bill, you are the editor. The latest edition of True North is the Emerging Leaders edition. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Diane. So I want to go back. I first talked about this with you, and I believe it was 2007, so here 16 years ago was when the original True North came out. Um, what's changed over the years? What is this? I know you're orienting this to a different audience, but has the core thesis evolved in some way? The core thesis is the same, that uh, we need leaders who are authentic and follow their True North. Uh, I think what's changed is the we're seeing a massive generational change right now. Uh, from the baby boomers, many of whom who have practiced uh, command and control leadership to the new generation, which is very much into empowerment and uh, following their purpose. And when I first came out with these ideas after I left Medtronic, even before that, uh, people <clears throat> said, well, that only works in healthcare business. I said, today, people don't want to work for a company unless they have some clear sense of purpose. And I, I say, bravo. And I think right now we need to make this big change. I, I wrote the new book to encourage uh, younger generation leaders on Gen X, which goes all the way into the early 50s, uh, millennials and Gen Z to step up and take the leadership roles now. Well, thank you for including Gen X because usually they, they jump over us and, uh, you know, move straight on to the, the, the millennials and Gen Z. I want to ask before getting deeper into what's happening right now as to, as to what, your true north is because, you know, you're often characterized as, you know, former CEO. You're obviously an academic as well. You're an author. Like, what? how do you think about um, your own sense of mission? Because you've spent as much time really sort of in that teaching mode and consulting mode at Harvard as you have in the CEO chair. Do you still see yourself still very much as sort of a leader practitioner who's um, passing on advice or do you see your own role differently? No, I do that. But uh, I think my purpose and my true north <clears throat> for a long time has been to help people reach their full potential. And I think back to each job I had in my career, including Medtronic, I never knew as much about the business as my subordinates did. Mm -hmm. And so my skill, if I had one, was bringing talented people together and getting them in the right spots so they could uh, reach their full potential and then to play together as a team and to build great organizations. So if I left a legacy at Medtronic, it was building uh, an organization that could continue to grow rapidly with a fantastic group of leaders. And so today at Harvard, I'm working with a lot of CEOs through our new CEO program and other programs, a lot of custom programs and leading global business, authentic leadership development. These are all courses that I believe are aimed at the same thing. How do we help leaders reach their full potential so they can flourish? I want to do a bit of a Rorschach test here because, you know, there's um, in terms of what's in the news and the type of leadership that we're seeing, Silicon Valley. Let's start with that. Um, what are your observations about the leadership you've seen out of the tech sector? Well, Silicon Valley is a founder led place. It's amazing. There's nowhere in the world like it and it's created incredible number of great companies. And I go all the way up to Seattle for Silicon Valley. So clearly mm -hmm. companies like Apple, uh, Microsoft and Amazon up there in Seattle, as well as uh, Google, uh, just amazing companies. And I remember in early days, many of my leadership ideas came from Hewlett Packard and you had the whole Intel generation. So uh, I've been concerned though, that the new generation is not is willing to bet on the long term and to do the hard work to build a great company for the long term, say, as Apple has. And uh, also from a governance standpoint, Diane, I think the, uh, the boards are more advisory boards for the newer companies because founders like Mark Zuckerberg have more than 50% uh, control of the voting shares. So those so newer companies- I think we've seen a lot of deviations because of that. So it's kind of praying at the edges is what I would say. But we need Silicon Valley to be that, that role model for the world, but also that engine of innovation. Well, let me just clarify, what companies are you putting into that category, the ones that make you concerned about the long-term? You mentioned Meta with Mark Zuckerberg. Is that 
Is it the Googles and Metas of the world? Or are you talking about yet another new generation coming up? No, I'm talking about a lot of the new ones, which really never prove themselves. In fact, okay. some of them are quite fraudulent, like uh, we found out with Theranos, right. with Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani. Uh, we've seen this recently, a woman named Charlie Javis that got a lot of money from J.P. Morgan Frank, Chase. Frank, yep. We've seen it with Adam Newman, and he's now got more money to pursue on apartments. But uh, what he tried to do with the office, and, uh, and so this worries me a lot, <clears throat> because even if they have... Oh, a good idea. If they aren't leading ethically, they're going to get in real trouble. And uh, we saw that particularly true with Sam Bankman Freed, uh, who's now Silicon Valley, but he's getting funded by Silicon Valley. So you, he's, he's an extension of that. He never really did anything. And he was saw himself as a crypto king, but he never did any good for anyone. And uh, now we've seen with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, where everyone was too inward looking and too turned inward, all betting on one bank and the bank didn't manage well so that's some examples of the newer companies uh and i wonder the question i would ask back to people and i do ask a lot of uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and innovators why are people putting so much money why does a brilliant guy like mark andres andres and horowitz that's funded so many great companies why is he putting all his money into saying bankman fried or why is he putting into adam newman uh i don't get it and i think there is a kind of fear of missing out on the part of some of these people. And sometimes there's too much money chasing too few ideas. What about Wall Street? I know that you've um, certainly from a board perspective familiar there. You know, when we talk about the zeitgeist and people shifting to purpose, you're on the front lines, you see students at, at Harvard. What's the appetite for both mm -hmm. working on Wall Street and, and the culture of Wall Street from where you sit? Well, the culture of Wall Street's always been about making money. I would hope that the companies that do that soundly, like take a JP Morgan, or I served on the board of Goldman Sachs or Morgan yeah. Stanley, uh, are flourishing. They're doing well and they're skeptical of things like crypto. They don't just jump in. What I worry about is now they're tightly regulated. Half our banking system is a shadow banking system. They're not regulated. That was the problem with Silicon Valley Bank and some of the others that got in trouble. But I think Wall Street is putting way too much pressure on companies to buy back stock. So an example of that would be Boeing. Mm -hmm. Boeing is the world's greatest aviation company. But about 15, 20 years ago, they said it was more important to buy back stock than it was to uh, develop new airplanes. And they kind of stopped doing that. And they did it with the 777, which is brilliant. 787 had nothing but problems. And that got them into the, the crash of the 737 MAX. But a lot of that, the root cause of that was pressure from investors to, uh, to buy back stock. So instead of investing in the companies and R&D and the long-term capital equipment and their people, they're buying back stock. They're using their cash. And I think it that's was not a good thing. Yeah. I think last year was a record year, more than a trillion dollars in buybacks in the S&P 500, which gets me to uh, of something that's always been a challenge when we talk about authentic leadership. One of the things that makes people most disaffected with CEO class, if that's the way to put it, is is pay. And this is the time of year when we start to see the proxy statements, the pay come out. And I'm looking, um, you know, a number of companies, the oil sector pay has gone up 52 percent over the previous year. How do you align that authentic leadership with what we've seen in terms of trends in CEO pay, because you can understand the cynicism that that can breed among the workers. Right. And you, you've been following this a long time. You've been a pioneer in this. You go back 25 years is when it got kind of the cat got out of the bag and everyone started seeing how much money they could pay their CEOs and became a ratchet effect. Now, partly that was driven by the amount of money that was in private equity and in hedge funds and in some of these founders making so much money. So they're trying to pay them like founders. The amount of stock they're giving some people now that are very capable CEOs, but it's almost it's over the top. And yes, it's tied to performance, which is a good thing, but I do think it's, it's gotten out of hand. <clears throat> and I think it just contributes to the income inequality you have in this country. I don't know how you can possibly pay a service worker, Diane, $7.25 an hour and uh, expect them to live. I don't think anyone can live on this. And so what we've done is we've seen the income go up to the higher end of the company, and we've neglected the people actually doing the work. I mean, you think about who you see in a restaurant, a hotel, or an airline, or at Medtronic, who's 
determining the quality of the product, not the quality department, it's the people on the front lines, the, the production people, that's what matters. And I think this is a giant societal problem. So it isn't just the amount of money that CEOs are taking out, it's the tonality and the impact on everyone else that's causing a split in our population. This has led to political splits, it's led to a lot of other things. So it worries me a lot. I'd like to see the income just spread much more broadly, bonuses, salaries, everything else, much more broadly across every employee. And I, I think we've got to get back to that because you know, a nation's strength is based on the strength of their middle class. That's why German industry has done so much for its people. And I think that's really important. We can't hollow out our American middle class by pushing all the income to the top. It, yeah, I think that the figure I saw was four, I think it's almost 400 times. Um, the average CEO is making about 400 times what workers make. Um, and that's, you know, versus 20 times, I guess, back, you know, probably the mid 60s. So um, is that what's your advice? Let's take this go back to the emerging leaders edition. Um, most people who are at Harvard are there because they're ambitious people in the business school and they want to make a lot of money. What's going to be um, how are we going to change this? The trend line continues to go up. What's your well, advice? I think MBA education needs to focus much more on developing leaders. We have too many managers, too many finance courses, too much so-called financial innovation. Financial innovation is not the same innovation as uh, the iPhone, for instance, yeah. uh, and, or a Medtronic defibrillator. And I think we need to really get business schools reoriented towards developing leaders that are driven by a purpose. They're not measuring themselves by their net worth. As I always told my students, still tell them, when your net worth is based on, when your self-worth is based on your net worth, you know you're in trouble. And, uh, and the media contributes this to a lot because we're saying, oh my gosh, look how great these people are. They're making billions like Mark Zuckerberg, like Elon Musk. And they give them too much credence without really looking at the character of the person. And I think, and how they're making money. Are they making money ethically? You know, stealing someone's uh, private information and reselling it to advertisers. Man, that's, that to me is a, a very flawed business model. So I think we need, Business schools, as well as corporations, need to focus on leaders who are driven by a sense of purpose and can bring people together on a common purpose, as we did at Medtronic, of restoring people to full life and health. It doesn't have to be a healthcare purpose. It may be creating sound financial futures for people in the finance industry. We need to do more of that and less how much money can we make off of people rather than how can we create secure futures for people. So we've got a long way to go. And I think the business school community has got a long way to go too in refocusing on developing leaders. Yeah, and, and you know, obviously people like Elon Musk are driven by a strong sense of purpose. Nobody would ever, if he's very purpose-driven, it's just not necessarily purpose in the way that somebody like you might define it. Well, uh, Elon, no, I think he did a fantastic thing with uh, Tesla. That's amazing. You know, I've worked a lot with the automobile company. Mm -hmm. No one's ever come out with a brand new technology car like the Tesla all electric uh, right out of the chute and had it work so well. I mean, you know, he is brilliant and he, I wish he would. Uh, and, you know, OK, SpaceX had a blow up yesterday, but I that happens, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but I, I, I uh, think he's I wish he get back to inventing. He's our greatest inventor of our era. He's the Steve Jobs of this era. But with Twitter, he's not inventing anything and he's just causing a lot of problems. And I see you know, the kind of opening up of anti-Semitism, racism, misogynistic statements, uh, homophobic, and not doing anything about it, and not controlling who comes on the site. This is a mess. And it's contributing to a lot of social strain right now. And I believe in free speech, but that, Diane, that's not free speech. Yeah. You're never saying like that in one of my classes. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Well, I want to I wanna round this out by going back to what both generationally, but you're talking about a societal issue right now, how divided people are, the rhetoric that we're seeing. What is the role of the business leader? You know, how much should we be putting on them to be addressing the issues that you're talking about, such as hate speech and the fact that half the country doesn't talk to the other half? I think that business leaders now, we have this political split in the country, let's be honest. And I think business leaders, most of them are quite moderates right down the middle. Most of them are what I would call fiscal conservatives, social liberals, or mm -hmm. social progressives, call it whatever you like. You call that Canadian. <laughs> I think they need to step up. And I think they are stepping up. 
And I just want to encourage the new generation to do that. And there's a lot of controversy about speaking out, but you need to speak out on issues important to you. If you're a Minneapolis CEO and George Floyd's murdered, you need to speak out. What are you doing for your black employees and your BIPOC employees? Uh, Chip Berg, who's CEO of, of Levi Strauss, has been very outspoken on matters of gun safety. See, he doesn't talk about gun control because he says, my customers are really concerned about gun safety. And, uh, and also, he sees abortion as a business issue. So rather than looking at it as a moral issue, he's looking at it as a business issue. And I think that's just say business people are pragmatists. They can pave the way. And I'm really trying to encourage them in my new book to be the ones to step up and, and take a principled stand and do the right thing. And yeah, I'm picking on some of the ones that uh, I don't think are doing the right thing, uh, like we have in social media, because I say like, people are harmed by it. And I love social media, I use it all the time, but it should be used for the right purpose. Yep. But yep. I do business think business leaders of this era can take on very, very important role. And frankly, you know, you have to ask yourself why in the Edelman Trust Meter, where 15 years ago, business people were at the bottom of the barrel, why is it they are the most trusted element of leaders in society? You have to ask yourself that. Because people don't it's trust because government. People have lost faith in the politicians to be that. And they're asking business leaders, please step up and uh, be that principled person. So part of being principal is not getting paid all the money and, and taking care of your people. Uh, kind of like Doug McMillan has done at Walmart. Fantastic job. So that's uh, how I see it. And I'm trying to spend my time these days trying to encourage people to do yeah. that. Well, it's uh, so the latest edition of True North, to, to your point, I think needed more than ever. And as always, thanks for joining us, Bill. Look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Diane. It's great to be with you. Okay.